Welcome to the Filmless Lines, the double feature podcast. Join us as we unravel the interwoven experience of the continuous conversation of cinema. Take part in pairing movies with their cursed counterparts, movies that share DNA, or even pairing questionable duos by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash filmless We offer tiers at the $1, $5, and $20 level, where the $5 tier will grant the ability to request films to further the discussion. So grab some popcorn, sit back, and get ready to join the 100-year conversation. This is The Filmesteins, where movies are more than just entertainment, they're an experience. They're an experience all around you. You, 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 you. And welcome back to another episode of the film of steins thank you guys for joining us today today i am joined by my country bumpkin friend lucy hello everyone you can join us every monday and friday for brand new episodes of the film of steins on all of our free feeds and every other wednesday on patreon.com slash film of steins for patreon exclusive episodes our most recent patreon exclusive episode is our ranking of tim burton's directed works in honor of the half-baked beetlejuice Some other recent episodes include X, Pearl, and Maxine, about two hours of Ty West's trilogy of films there, and the recently released Long Legs. The scariest movie I've ever seen in my life. Remember to leave nice comments, thoughts, and ideas on our Patreon as well. Come subscribe for a dollar. Come write in. Come request a movie. Leave nice reviews on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. Are you stressed and filled with anxiety like I am? Maybe in a bit of pain from that car accident you had a few years ago? Well, the sponsor of today's episode, Hempville CBD, has us covered. They have the highest quality products created by chemists and doctors. Hempville carries everything from CBD to THC dispensary grade without those despicable dispensary prices. Order your Delta 8, 9, edibles, and vapes along with the THCA flower and get free shipping when you spend $50 or more at HempvilleCBD.com. Check out the link in the description for more details. But today we will be discussing Lee Isaac Chung's 2020 film, Minari. Minari's been on my radar for a while. I just haven't got around to it. When I first saw screenshots, I was like, oh man, this is my kind of movie. And I'm happy to report back that this is an awesome movie. I always tell myself I wish more movies took place in the South. Minari's awesome, and I hope you agree. Even with it being kind of over the top, being named Minari and how, you know, resilient and I don't know if you know this, but Minari, the plant, fails its first harvest, it dies, and then comes back as a somewhat very invasive, hardy species, so it's hard to get rid of once it's truly established. Obviously, very true to any group of people who wants to, you know, displace themselves and move across country, across the world, to find a new life, especially when depicted on camera on the landscape of the American dream kind of thing. Nothing but resilience and suffering to see that dream come a reality. We get a film that's charged with a very interesting religious angle. We have a film here where this character halfway in the movie hijacks the film, which is awesome. We have a very interesting child actor. I like David a lot. And we have a really strange neighbor named Paul. What do you think of Minari, my man? Yeah, this was a very sweet movie. I enjoyed it quite a bit. It was very endearing, very heartfelt. I always appreciate a good immigrant experience type of movie, but especially immigrants to the U.S. Those are always nice to see because to some people, America is the land where you come to fulfill your dreams. And to other people, it's a land where hardships aren't as bad because it can provide so many economic opportunities, freedom, and an overall better quality of life. And I appreciate how this movie separates those two. We have two very different reasons on why our main characters want to be in America. And the film goes into 
the different types of sacrifices. We have several themes of acceptance and family and resilience and assimilation, which felt a bit nuanced, but it still had enough not to make this a slice of life film. Yeah, it tiptoes right up to that line, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it did. Which I'm glad because slice of life films are on the more boring side for me. So we had enough here that it didn't. I'm so glad. It had some feel good moments. I love those. We had some funny moments like the water of mountains that everyone in this film loved. But I'm still trying to pick apart the characters. I think there was a big range of how these characters were portrayed that I'm still trying to pick apart. I'm not sure how I felt about them. I thought David was great and the grandma were great, but I wasn't sure about our other characters, especially Anne, the daughter. Yeah, yeah, Anne was a little neglected. A lot of neglected, yes, for sure. I also don't know how I feel that the movie's supposed to take place in the 80s and I did not get 80s vibes. From this movie because I tend to really like that thrown in my face like whoa this is clearly a 70s movies 80s movies whatnot well pause right there I think it's really interesting that the movie does take place in the 80s because we're familiar with the south a lot of us are right and it doesn't feel 40 years old it feels like it really could have been now in a rural area and I think it just goes to show you that a lot of the south hasn't changed for a century or more at least 50 years right right exactly and that's one thing i love about the south as a location in movies so yeah there's there's a certain charm to it that i can't quite place if i like it or not i i I guess i want to be in the 80s if i'm in the 80s but it's not relevant to this movie this movie is just trying to tell a very personal story and i think it told it very well Yeah, one other thing I think really starts to separate itself from the slice of life it tiptoes up to is its use of symbolism, especially through its religious lens, which I think is so cool. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You know how people will say something's a little too on the nose when they're criticizing something or when something's just really not kind of clicking with them on a deeper level, I guess? Yeah. I'm not really sure how to take that i feel like this might be the kind of movie that someone might say that to with names like jacob and paul and monica and david in the garden of eden right and them going to church and then also paul dragging the cross down the street it's very over the top in its religiosity visual verbiage but i really really enjoy it here the only reason i bring up why people say something is on the nose is because i'm trying to figure out exactly what that means kind of like how we brought up once before what pretentious is in film yeah i don't think this film is on the nose is that the saying hits the nose on the nose on the nose i think what does that mean to you i guess that means it's just obvious super obvious and i don't think this was super obvious here maybe paul's character was a little bit more obvious but i don't think it was on the nose so is on the nose a way to indicate to the person you're talking to that that movie is beneath you that you're kind of putting yourself above this in an artistic manner yeah i'm not sure because i don't hear that term used quite often in the film industry as you do in other situations So I bet there's some kind of negative connotation to someone saying on the nose to a film, like pretentious. It almost seems eye-rolling, like, Mm. oh, that's just on the nose, and you you don't even give it a second thought, a further thought. It doesn't require any analysis from you. For example, to your point earlier about the title, Minari having some symbolism, and it being a little on the nose if you think about it a little further the minari yes it survived drawing this parallel to the family that's also surviving but it's very important that this minari is surviving in foreign soil 
And furthermore, I think it's super important that it was the grandma that brought the Minari from Korea to have it planted here. And if this was an example of something that's on the nose, I don't think it's quite obvious like that. Because in that case, it wouldn't have mattered who brought it from where. Yeah, because the grandma is basically the kind of rekindled love and companionship in this family and not even a romantic way but much more fundamental because she opens these people up you know especially david but she opposes you know jacob when he's trying to whoop david the grandma especially puts the parents through you know a bit of fear having her stroke and getting sent to the hospital she reintroduces this element of cooperation and companionship with these people while also bringing the memory of who these people are right yeah bringing the heritage of who these people are and i guess it's just really a grandma thing to be tasked with you come to your adult children's life get it back in order and we symbolize that by her planting this korean or really just asian vegetable which is a celery apparently type of celery minari (laughs) it's funny you say she rekindled because she almost literally rekindled because she caught everything on fire (laughs) and i mean that was another one of those awesome symbolisms in this film the fire itself that the grandma started i mean it it, it's wonderfully tied in very low key but it's wonderfully tied in the grandma along with jacob's american dream and you know just having to work too and living in the rural area dealing with monica dealing with monica she didn't do nothing It sets up this equation of really great suffering, too, which is obviously necessary to sell the idea of an American dream. But also, while being on the back of this proverb-esque situation, kind of identifying that suffering is just being human. And I think that especially rings true when, you know, we have Jacob, named Jacob, who in the Bible, represents the truest form of a human, someone who's passionate, a risk-taker, a deceiver, and taking even further in a really beautiful way with Paul being this maintenance of will, kind of balancing Jacob's shenanigans and sanity, sort of forcing Jacob to maintain faith, too. Which is also funny, because it kind of comes around full circle when Jacob should have more faith in his surroundings and the established culture that's already there, like trusting the man with the sticks to find water. (laughs) But I will say, I can't identify the real reason behind the religious symbolism outside of the representative kind of essences of each of these characters. Same thing with David being the story that wasn't written. He is the story to be told. So is Monica a name in the Bible too? Uh, Yes, sort of. St. Augustine would refer to St. Monica as the mother. So it's fitting, but I don't think in a more representative way. She's just the mother here. Yeah, and Anne's nowhere to be found. Ah. Yeah, that's very interesting. I didn't pay a lot of attention to the Bible symbolism, the faith symbolism, besides Paul. He was the very obvious one. Yeah, who's over the top in the best way? He was over the top in the best way, yes. I love that he's like, have you ever heard of an exorcism? I'm like, (laughs) yes, Paul, yes. (laughs) Give him one right now. And I guess I just took that as faith and religion being such a big part of the South. Yeah, absolutely. I kind of took that in that Paul was this echo of Jacob's anxiety and tension just inside his head that we weren't really capable of seeing and he was just that that mirror yeah he's that good friend you find that you know is good for you yeah and you keep around to calm your ass down and i love that when times got tough they accepted his offer to perform a mild exorcism around the house that was awesome yeah that was kind of when jacob finally bent the knee of falling in sync with this area and becoming just and finding some kind of unity. 
because I think that was when we hit that inflection point of this pendulum of <laughs> luck for Jacob and his family. Because I think right after that, he found someone to buy his food. David's hole in his heart was getting smaller. Monica maybe had a modicum of hope. So I think I identified three major dynamics. That being Paul and Jacob, Monica and Jacob, and David and Sunya, the grandma. What do you think about these dynamics? They're all very different from one another. They're my favorite part of the film. How these five people talk to each other with just each other. Their interactions, of course, especially Grandma and little David. I think the obvious standout dynamic was between the Grandma and David. David had Grandma drink pee, and she wasn't that upset. She sounds like a fun Grandma. (laughs) Grandma brings this feralness with her and reminds these people how to live. She reminds David to be a kid. Don't be so uptight. Reminds these two adults to not be so uptight. Just relax. Live a little. Things are going to be okay. You know, grandma's going to do her grandma tricks like take that $100 out of the offering plate at church. Grandma's not going to let you put that $100 in there when you know damn well you can't afford to do that. But we have this really awesome evolution between David and grandma where David starts from Hiding behind his mom, not wanting to connect with the grandma in any way. Something we can all probably relate to, not wanting to meet family, the stranger that is this inherited supposed relationship that's predetermined and established before you're even born. There's an awkwardness there that is really fun, but it develops to the point where David, this little kid, is worrying about death of course because he overheard his mom talking about it in his heart murmur but he's consoling in grandma while she's lying on the floor i like that with her strange pillow i want a pillow like that i didn't even see the pillow and of course she doesn't know how to take that because why is a child saying these things worrying about death if they're going to go to heaven or hell no definitely grandparents are some of the most beautiful things on this planet Because they're here to put your parents on check. All the shit your parents are doing wrong, grandmas are going to come in and fix it. When a movie makes a decision to add a grandparent into the equation, it's always going to be for some comedic relief and some sort of lesson learned or some wisdom. Our grandma here was hilarious. Everything she did was funny. I loved when they were basically talking shit about her saying like oh she's not even a real grandma and she don't even know how to write or whatever they were saying about her behind her back she's like and then she's like in english you love grandma or you you happy grandma's here i don't know what she said but that was that was hilarious or even watching her watch tv wrestling she was watching wrestling right yeah in her boxers and david's like why are you not a normal grandma and she gambles And she gambles, yes. And she becomes obsessed with Mountain Dew. It's hilarious. But like we said early on in the beginning, she's here for a reason. She's here to bring the family back together. This very obvious symbolism of rebirth after she's the one who catches the barn on fire makes her a very important piece to this film. And it's not just her dynamic with David, but it's also her dynamic with her daughter. Again, because we're trying to focus on David, this is more his story than anyone else's, even the dad's, but I like her interactions with everybody. I really like the scene where she brought things from Korea and is giving them to the daughter and she's smelling them and she's like, oh my god. And her daughter Monica is looking at the things that the grandma brought and telling her how she can't get anything this good here in the u.s and whatnot and and being able to relate with that it was such a heartwarming scene nothing like when my grandma comes to town though that's more chaotic very loud everyone's trying shit everyone and i mean everyone that can fit in the living room will fit in the living room watching grandma unpack shit and hand shit out hearing stories it's it's almost like a very small intimate party 
but very loud. Yeah, bringing things like your favorite spice or favorite vegetable or whatever grandma brought Monica, it's different than moving even just across the world because you can move from California to Florida and have this sense of isolation and and feel alone, but it hits way harder when your favorite things aren't there to help comfort you. Right. There's so much emotion in that room when grandma comes to visit, and I can only imagine this feeling that I feel being super intensified for my mom because the grandma that visits us is my mom's mom. So I can only imagine how she feels when she gets to smell these spices or gets to see her mom, gets to see the little piece of home. And we don't have that in this film. We don't have this chaoticness, this craziness that the Mexicans do. But it's super personal and it's super simple. It's not like a party, but that same feeling is there. The piece of home being brought back, this gratefulness that your parent can even come to visit. Because opposite to my mom's side is my dad's side, whose mom could never come visit. And she did pass away before he could visit her in Mexico. So I'm sure that gratefulness for my mom gets crazy. And just this family bonding part. And as short as that scene was, and even with that scene, there was a focus on David not wanting to meet his grandma. It had so much going on there that I really appreciated. Yeah, their little relationship hijacked the film, David and Grandma. Yeah. Especially when she showed up. It's like, oh man, this is the spotlight now. You're kind of hitting on one frustration I have with this film. One reason I can't let myself love it so much. We seem to be lacking this emotional tension just out of the stubbornness and uncertainty that's kind of revolving around these people right now with trying to make things happen, moving to a place that Monica definitely didn't want to go. And we get really great moments with Jacob and Monica with them fighting, but I wish we could have gotten something, I don't know about explosive, but something a little bit more with Monica and her mom. Maybe not face to face, but just some kind of offhand type stuff here and there. Not with them fighting or anything like that, but just something a little bit more that would have helped tie all these people together a little bit. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. We had so little of their interactions and even Jacob and the grandma's interactions. I would have liked to see a little bit more of them. Yeah, absolutely. But I also think it's important that we didn't because... They were working so much. Yeah, I get that. And I guess, and to be fair, I'm a little bit more sold on Jacob and Grandma's interactions because there's this lack of relationship I'm getting out of them. But it's also hard to say that when the same thing is kind of happening with Monica and the Grandma too, with her mom. So I may be justifying just the negligence of it. One other star relationship, I thought, was Monica and Jacob. I don't know if you can call it much of a relationship, but there was this air of history, right? I think we probably all have a love-hate relationship with parents fighting on screen, especially when there's kind of yell whispering happening. Of course, there's this sense between Monica and Jacob that they've argued about the same thing countless times and they argue over countless things. And one thing I always think about from a filmmaker's perspective is how scary do you want to make these moments? Because they can be really explosive, like we saw in Anatomy of a Fall. Oh, yeah. With it, you know, that moment being kind of the spotlight moment of the movie. which It's a great moment. It's the only really great moment in that movie. But here they're much more low-key, and they're almost a quiet sort of yell. Probably because they're Asian. Maybe, maybe they're just much more respectful to each other (laughs) and respectful to the children, maybe more importantly. Yes. There's something really beautiful about that. Of course, you want to see people maybe get along at some point and these two really don't get along. And I have to say, I'm all team Jacob. Fuck Monica. No. They agreed to come out to Arkansas from California. All right. She needs to 
chill the fuck out for a little bit. She needs to, I don't know how long they've been here, of course. I don't know how long Grandma's been with them. I don't know how long they've been working at the chicken sexer in Arkansas. It may have helped kind of justify her annoyance with it and her quitting time. But she didn't have enough faith in Jacob. From the get-go, it felt like. It's been a while. Because when we're first introduced to the house, it's bare. Bare bones. And as the film goes on, we start seeing these small little details in the background, which is something I really enjoy about the film, by the way. We start seeing some steps. We start seeing some side paneling around the mobile home. We start seeing a barn. We start seeing all these time has passed moments without showing us too. without showing us without telling us well it's been six months since it you know i mean that's well said and it, all these additional things are very natural things to include in the house just like the seasons changing or something we don't need yes. to say it it's true so it's been some time farming equipment is so expensive i can only imagine he's got this hillbilly paul helping him is he working for free? Yeah, is is he working for free? I don't know. I kind of get the feeling he might be. I don't know. But, okay, but will Jacob let him work for free? He seems like the kind of man that would at least pay him some money. Or Monica and, would force him. And not take charity. Or she would feel obligated to, yes. But the most important part of Monica's annoyance, and I completely understand, is that her kid is sick and she fears for his life enough that David overhears the conversation and now this little kid's fearful of his life. She's so scared because the first thing she tells him is make sure you keep some money aside for David. One of her biggest fears is that they're an hour away from the hospital. It's true. She brings it up several times. Yes. That that alone is enough justification for me for her to be as crazy as she wants. But come on. David's doing just fine. Look at him. <laughs> Grandma's got him. No. She, if they were alone and they just started out, them two had just come to the U.S. and he wanted this dream of starting a farm. All right. But no, now you got two kids. You got a sick kid. Now my grandma came to live with us. She had a stroke. Your ass better be about to break through with this fucking farm or you're going to do something else about it because I cannot live with this stress anymore. Their water is cut off. I completely completely (laughs) understand monica and her bitchiness as you say (laughs) i'll think about that okay but we solve it because at the end of the film i guess the end end is with jacob and david by the minari but before that she starts becoming a part of the farm exactly and she realizes that she needs to put some fucking effort into this. She realizes with Jacob. that they need to be a team. They need to work together. But, it took grandma having a stroke to figure that out. But hold up. It happens after the hole in David's heart got smaller. So she has some relief. She has this moment of, oh, now I need to put some faith into this man that brought me here into this time that allowed my child's heart to heal. So she comes around. She comes around. Give her give her some time. She's got breathing room now that her mom is at least not dead. She had a stroke. Very unfortunate because the grandma was wild. She's no longer going to be the same again. And that's fucking heartbreaking. She had to give some of her soul to the family. Yeah. But she's walking. She's doing a little more every day. And David's heart is healing. So she just needed to, she didn't, she needed to come around. Don't hate on Monica. And what did the doctor say? I he, know, that was said hilarious. said Ozark water or whatever must be healing David. That was hilarious. But That would have been a moment that if I were Jacob, I would have looked at Monica and given her like a, mm, I would have been like, so. see, bitch. <laughs> I did think this movie was going to be a bit sadder than it was i did too but i will say i teared up a little no tears came flowing but just this like very slight knot in my throat and a little bit of a build up of tears in the eyeballs and it's 
my absolutely fucking favorite part of the film is when David's running to get his grandma to bring her back home. There's a lot going on here. You know, they're calling out to the grandma. At first, you're like, where, where is grandma? Where is she going? And then you realize that she's leaving because she feels bad. She feels bad that she caused this fire. She caused things to burn. She doesn't want to see her family like this, but she's also thinking they don't want me here anymore. At least that's how I took it, because why would you walk away like that? I mean, and that's a natural response, I think. You know, I'm a piece of shit, man. I got to get <laughs> out of here. And it's really sad that a grandma is going to do that and feel that way. Yeah, and she accidentally caught it on fire because of her stroke. It wasn't any malicious. and I mean, oh, it was just so sad. And you can't tell grandma to stop. Grandmas are going to work. Yes. Grandmas are going to fight. See, that's why grandmas and grandparents, I think, are just so raw in their survival at this point. Because they're not worried about what they're going to say. They're not worried about whose feelings they're going to hurt. They're just going to do whatever they're going to do. But David starts running after her. And it's so freaking good. And it hits you in all the feels. Because first of all, David is running. This whole movie... Everyone told him he can't run. He's got this heart problem. He shouldn't be running. Even at some point, he attempts to run and doesn't feel good. But to get grandma, he has to run. And don't get me started on the score that plays in the background while he's running. I mean, it was just so full of hope. But then he grabs her hand and tells her, come on, grandma, we're going home. When this whole entire movie, he tried to get rid of her because she's not a real grandma. It was just, it was so, it was so good. Lee Isaac Chung's grandma is obviously the most important person to him. Yeah, for sure. When you have someone drive away one of your biggest fears, how can you not love them? Yeah, I saw this thought online mentioning that there's an objectivity to this film, that there's not a focus on a hero, per se. And I completely disagree with that notion because... Of what grandma brings out of David, especially. No, of course, because this is almost a coming of age story for David. Almost. This is sort of his story. And this is the pivotal moment of his life where grandma came to fix the family and to fix him. That's silly to say that there's no hero in this movie. I also saw that there was some controversy with this movie winning best foreign language film at the 78th golden globe awards people were mad that this movie won in the foreign film category calling it a very american film and the only reason it would even be considered foreign because i think by definition there's a certain amount of words that need to be in a different language in a movie to be considered a foreign film, at least for this award. I'm not sure about all awards. So people were a bit back and forth on their winning of this award. And it's funny because I, like probably so many other either immigrant children that were brought here as children or U.S. born children to Mexican or foreign parents, don't know exactly what you would categorize yourself as either. Then you start getting into semantics and what is an American, what is a Mexican, and all that stuff. Yeah, sure. It's sort of like Alejandro Inurito, the guy who did The Revenant and most recently did Bardo, a movie about being rejected by your origins when you kind of made it somewhere else. There's this sense of losing touch with some part of your past which is no doubt very interesting and it displays the tribalism but as far as the award and lee isaac here getting it i think we're splitting hairs a little bit what does it matter if he was born in america and made a movie about korean people speaking korean like 
What makes that less of a Korean movie than any of Bong Joon-ho's movies? Is Snowpiercer, which is 99% English, more Korean than this? Just because Bong Joon-ho is a Korean guy making a movie? Yeah, that's like saying The Revenant is... Yeah. It's Mexican. Is a Mexican film, yeah. The Revenant's a Mexican movie. All right. You heard it here. You heard it here. I think immigration movies, especially good ones like this, can also do a very great job of showing you how not different we are from each other, too. And how it's especially sad in these types of movies, not just immigration movies, but where you get transplanted from one place to another for some reason. This isolation that takes over you is such an unnecessary weight that we all bear at times. When we all just want a house, we just want good food or pet to be entertained, to maybe marry or have kids. Right. Everyone wants the American dream, even Americans. You want that high economic status. You want that freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of whatever, press. I don't know all the freedoms, but you want freedom. We want our guns. You want your guns. (laughs) And we all want a better quality of life. We all want those things. We all want to be able to do whatever we want to do, not what we were born into. Yeah, my thoughts on that are that, A, if I had to read the subtitles, (laughs) you're considered foreign to me. Although I have to read subtitles for other movies too, but different reasons. And B, an award is an award. You know what I'm saying? Like a scholarship is a scholarship. It's not that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal. I'll take it. You don't want me to have it, but I have it. I'm sorry. Go speak to the people that gave it to me if you really care, but... It's just an award. I didn't win a bajillion dollars and took it away from you. I didn't hurt you in the process. And anyone who made a film that year and a foreign film that year should already feel really proud of themselves for doing that and hopefully don't take an award loss to heart. The award doesn't justify the work. You know, the work justifies the awards. All right, man. Well, thank you for watching this movie and talking about it here today. You're welcome. Do you have a budget guess? My budget guess is $5 million. It is an A24 film. It wasn't over two hours. We have a lot of nature shots. And whatever was shot elsewhere was in a mobile home, not a bunch of sets. So I don't think it was crazy high. I don't think it was in the 10 mil. But having Steven Yoon threw me off a little. So I don't know if that would have made it a higher budget than I'm thinking. Or if because he is American Korean, he just wanted to be a part of this film. Don't know. But I'm locking in five mil. He was in Okja. Speaking of Bong Joon-ho. He was in Okja. Yeah, and the movie takes place in the South. So you got to imagine. It's got to be way cheaper than where they film in Atlanta or New York or wherever the fuck ever. Totally. Just another reason to film in the South. Yeah, gas down here is like $2 and something. What well, says here the budget was $2 million. Whoa, I'm impressed. And it went on to make $15.5 million. Okay. That's awesome. And over on Letterboxd with 510,000 people, most of which did not go to the theater. Clearly. They weighed in at a 4.1. 4.1? Wow. That's really high, isn't it? That's pretty high. That's very loved. I get it, and I don't at the same time, because I feel like we're missing some essential juice, and that's, I think, in the relationships. Yeah, we either needed Grandma Dead, which I love that we gave her a stroke, so we didn't need Grandma Dead. We needed maybe David to go to the hospital and causing some kind of tension. Some between- panic. <laughs> Yes, between Some Monica. Extra panic. <laughs> yes. We needed a little bit more of Anne being part of this family. Or don't include her. David can be an only child. Yes, yeah, Anne's presence was weird. Yes. That's the only thing that ruined the scene for me at the end when David runs to grandma. Because who who is she? It's fair. 
I'm giving it a three. Solid, solid movie, solid watch. Didn't bore me. Could have bored me, but it didn't. And like I said, I'm a sucker for these immigration stories. And you caused some 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 buildup of the tear tear ducks. Yeah, I was bouncing between a three and a three point five. This movie's begging to be a three point five in my mind, but just isn't quite on that level. It's not tied in enough for me. We need another ten or fifteen minutes between grandma and Jacob and Monica. Some kind of some kind of oomph between them. And I may not have been mad at a David catastrophe scene. Just a little scare. <laughs> Just a little scare. <laughs> that would be funny. Well, man, thank you again for talking about this movie here today. And thank you guys for listening to this episode of The Film of Steins. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Remember, we post every Monday and Friday on all of our free feeds with brand new episodes of The Film of Steins. And every other Wednesday... On patreon.com slash filmasteins for Patreon exclusive episodes like our Tim Burton ranking episode. Our next episode will be on the film Twisters, the new 2024 catastrophe movie, I think. I am so excited. You excited? I'm so excited. To see some carnage. I was hoping we would go see this movie, and we are, and I'm excited. We recently watched the first Twister. What do you think? That was awesome. I've never seen a cow <laughs> twirl in the air. Oh my god. It was it was crazy balls. It was okay. <laughs> I've never I've never been scared oh my of a god. tornado. We don't get them very often here in the south. We get some storms and we get the wind, but no actual tornadoes. But I've seen a few trampolines in people's backyards that shouldn't be there. We're like a small tornado went through here. Yeah, small tornadoes. Some trees knocked down. But man, that shit is crazy. Does that actually happen to people? That is insane. Oh, yeah. Wizard of Oz, you know? But like <laughs> actual cows floating up in there? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I really don't know. But yeah, join us for that. Twisters, that'll be fun. Hopefully it's a decent movie and not just this schlocky blockbuster nonsense. I'm fine with this schlocky block broccoli nonsense. But remember to go buy our Patreon as well and come subscribe for a dollar, five dollars, one hundred dollars. Come request a movie. If you subscribe for a hundred dollars, we will, for a whole month, cover the movies that you want. Sounds like a great deal to me. Go rate us on Apple Podcasts too. We appreciate all the support. Thank you guys very much. But until next time, take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. And that's a wrap for today's episode of The Filmasteins. Thanks for tuning in and joining us on our cinematic journey. We hope you enjoyed the discussion and gained some new insights and perspectives on the world of movies. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform, especially Patreon at patreon.com slash filmasteins, and follow us on social media for more film-related content. We love hearing from our listeners, so if you have any feedback, suggestions, movie recommendations, or book recommendations, please feel free to reach out to us. Until next time, keep watching and keep loving the magic of movies. This is The Filmasteins, signing off. Grrrr. <sighs>